Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. We, we have a very uh, tight schedule. We have uh, 45 minutes to get through 12 extraordinary years. A tiny little moment of context. I remember being here 12 years ago with Trevor Nunn in his And Finally platform. And I looked up there and the door opened and in silhouette was yourself standing oh. up there. And I just thought, will I make it? I'm here. I did it. So <laughs> result. Great. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm usually the one asking the questions, I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if, if things get sticky, I will ask my own questions. I'm just, I'm just, it's fair enough. I'm just warning It's fair you. enough. Um, I'd like to start, if we may, bef before you became director of the National Theatre. Um, you talked uh, when we were doing NT50 recently about your first encounter with the National Theatre in Manchester. I wonder if you'd just remind us of that first encounter. Yeah, I saw a production of The Merchant of Venice. Uh, with Olivier as Shylock when I was a kid in Manchester. It toured, I think it was doing its out of town run, which, uh, which used to happen in those days. It was the uh, first and only time I saw Olivier live. Uh, and, um, and I was bowled over. I was, at, I was that age where I was, um, where I was bowled over by most things. I then saw Anthony Hopkins play Coriolanus uh, at the Old Vic on a visit to London. Uh, I think it's generally thought that The Merchant of Venice was a great production, that the Coriolanus wasn't. But for a teenager to see Anthony Hopkins in full flood in the flesh was pretty overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It was so, uh, so I, I know a lot, um, a lot of our regular patrons go right back uh, to 1963. Um, I'd, I wish I'd I wish I'd seen all that stuff, but that's that's all I saw of the uh, of the Olivier years. And then the first time you directed here was in this room. It was uh, it was uh, a play called Ghetto by Joshua Sobol, Israeli writer. Uh, it was um, a complete surprise to me that soon after Richard Eyre was appointed uh, director of the National, uh, he. He asked to meet me. I'd never met him before. Uh, we uh, we had coffee uh, in a in a cafe near his house, and he asked me to be an associate director of the National Theatre, which was something to which I said yes, absolutely, immediately. That that felt like the thing I wanted to do most in the world. And then the next thing, the next thing that happened was this new play uh, arrived, uh, which uh, which they were committed to doing. Uh, and it was, uh, d there are no funny stories about it. It was an extraordinary play about an extraordinary subject, about, um, about the Yiddish theatre troupe uh, of uh, Vilna, Lithuania, which, uh, which became uh, the ghetto theatre troupe after, uh, uh, in, in, in the early 40s, when um, the Jews of Vilna, Vilnius were confined to a ghetto. Uh, and they kept going. Uh, right up until their extermination. And the play was organized around the songs that they wrote, which survived the war. So uh, at the heart of the play were performances of songs, laments, most of them, uh, written by and for the actors uh, who our actors were playing. And it was, uh, it was, a, it was um, not a sentimental play. It was a, it was a complicated play written by an Israeli uh, addressing um, issues which were very difficult in Israel at the time, uh, addressing uh, what was involved in uh, surviving the Holocaust and arriving after the Holocaust in Israel. So it was a, it was an, a, a, a very moving and complicated play, uh, it, which was um, not by any means the first time I worked with Alex Jennings, uh, who played the SS commandant of, uh, of the ghetto, but one of his many great performances. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, from there, uh, the beginning of a very important collaboration with Alan Bennett, Wind in the Willows and Madness of George III. Yeah. After, after Ghetto had opened, uh, d I thought it would be, it would be um, a good and refreshing next step to do a kids show. And I've, I've, later, 
I've, I've discovered over the last uh, um, 12 years why Richard was so thrilled when I went into his office and said, um, do you fancy a big family show in the Olivier? Because the answer to that question is yes. Uh, yes, are you bl yes, please. What have you got up your sleeve? And I told him that uh, I'd always fancied staging The Wind in the Willows, which was a favorite book of mine when I was a kid. Uh, that's shifted. Um, I would be less inclined now um, to, uh, to look at the Victorian and Edwardian classics, although uh, this year, actually, having said that, we've done Treasure Island, but in a, in a very contemporary, funky adaptation. Um, and w Wind in the Willows, uh, Richard, um, we, w we both of us uh, um, immediately thought that the obvious person to approach was Alan, whose reading of the book um, was already yeah. uh, famous on Radio 4. And it is my eternal good fortune that Alan, uh, was, Alan was up for it. Uh, and he says himself that our working relationship began with him saying to me when I went to visit him for the first time, uh, which was three or four months after uh, the lady in the van, Miss Shepherd, had, um, had, had finally vacated um, <laughs> uh, um, on account of her... Um, uh, 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 she, dr drove, she drove the van straight to heaven and, uh, and it had gone. Um, I, he said, I don't, I, 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 don't, I don't know how you're going to do this. How, how are you going to do a train? How are you going to do a barge? I said, you don't need to worry about that. I'll do that. Just write it. As a, <laughs> and that's, that is very much how we've, uh, how we've worked ever since. He claims to have no visual imagination, which is not true. Uh, but he has left, a, um, he has trusted me with the staging of his plays. Um, and after The Wind in the Willows cl closed, not long after The Wind in the Willows mm. closed, the Man of George III simply arrived on my doorstep. Um, and, uh, and that was the beginning of our relationship proper because that play came, as so many of his plays do, as all of his plays do, um, in a very unformed state, not, not yet found its centre, not yet found its focus. And we have always worked together um, to find out what the spine of his plays what the spine of his plays is. Uh, he, again, he claims he never knows, but I think I, I, playwrights differ. Many playwrights uh, are very eager um, to put something out there and to work with a director, with actors, to find out what they've got. M m um, others don't deliver until they've got it locked down. Um, but Man of George III was... Um, was kind of uh, it was that was the beginning of of, um, of what's been have gone on since really. Uh, another stroke of good fortune was that I had happened to see uh, shortly before Alan delivered the play Shadowlands, uh, which was the play about C.S. Lewis, in which Nigel Hawthorne played C.S. Lewis. Um, and I'd been completely bowled over, but I hadn't known that that was, uh, that kind of thing was, I shamefully hadn't known that that kind of thing was within Nigel's range. So he felt like a very obvious place to go to. And his involvement from a very early stage shaped the play because uh, we read it at the studio. I mean, we, 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 it would be an exaggeration to say we workshopped it. Alan, Alan is not of that generation of playwrights, but we read it. Nigel already had an extraordinary performance um, in embryo, and subsequent drafts of the play were for Nigel. Um, and uh, every now and then, even during the run, um, N Nigel would essentially take over. There was one... Um, Forgive me if you've heard this before, but it, it's one of the, the, the favourite things that I've ever witnessed. Um, there was one for Julian Wadden played uh, William Pitt, uh, the younger, the Prime Minister. And uh, they'd been doing it a very long time. This happened, I think, on the American tour. And uh, the first scene that the King had with Mr. Pitt uh, was the routine weekly audience that the monarch has with the Prime Minister. And the scene started, as we were immediately led to believe it always started, uh, with the king saying, married yet, Mr. Pitt, what, what? And um, Mr. Pitt would go, no, your majesty. 
And he'd say, uh, got your eye on anybody? Hey, hey. No, your majesty. And the king would, well, a man should marry. And then there'd be a kind of peon of praise. So what is in the text, a peon of praise to the institution of marriage. Um, and Julian was brilliant as William Pitt, utterly uh, imperturbable, chilly. And Nigel was everything as the king. He was, he was mischievous, uh, unpredictable, um, uh, superior, and then furious, uh, d deeply moving, of course, in the middle of the play. Uh, so Nigel had all the colors, and Julian, had the one, and Julian played the one color in this scene. But one night his mind wandered. And Nigel went, married yet, Mr. Pitt? And Julian said, yes, your majesty. <laughs> <laughs> and you just, you just didn't mess with Nigel. And you saw his eyes narrow. And he said, who to, Mr. Pitt? What, what? <laughs> Complete panic. You see Julian. Julian suddenly complete, he was suddenly right back in the present. And he went, uh, 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 the daughter of the Duchess of Huddersfield, your majesty. <laughs> completely invented branch of the aristocracy. <laughs> to which Nigel said, what's she like, Mr. Pitt? <laughs> <laughs> which is what Nigel, that's, that's, that's what Nigel Hawthorne was like. It was, uh, the whole thing was, uh, was blissful, actually. Yeah. And became a film. Became a film, yeah. yeah. It was, uh, that, was, that was my first, and I think uh, so far my best film, because, and I mean this pretty seriously, I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, the director of photography with whom I've worked on virtually every film I've made, Andrew Dahn, said to me when we were looking for locations, uh, he said, you only make your first film once, you don't know what's impossible, so ask for everything that occurs to you, because soon enough, uh, you will know not to ask because you'll know how impractical it is. And that, I that is indeed what happens. And there was a kind of innocence, ridiculous innocence, about the decisions we made on that film. Um, and I learned everything I know about making films from Andrew Dunn, who shot it, and Tariq Anwar, who edited it. Um, and they have just shot, Andrew has just shot, and Tariq is in the process of editing uh, the film of The Lady in the Van, which we shot in the autumn and will come out in November. Great. Uh, to, to move ahead, nodding obviously at Carousel, which was another extraordinary um, piece of work, to uh, was there, when, when was the moment you had the National in your sights? Uh? Well, I knew I definitely didn't want to do it when Richard announced that he was moving on. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to do it better. I couldn't think of a, or differently even, I couldn't think of a different way to do it. Uh, Richard ran it absolutely brilliantly. And it was an enormous education um, and privilege to be his associate. And the only experience I had, um, really, of running an institution as big as this was watching Richard do it. Uh, I'd never run anything before, but when he, when he said he was moving on, it was time to consider whether I was prepared to throw my hand into the ring, and I absolutely wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, I had just made the movie and I'd done Carousel and I'd, I'd spent um, uh, three or four years um, having um, an exciting time, uh, more in America than here, but that was something I needed to go through. I, I, I was, I was, uh, New York is a fraction of the theatre town that London is. I mean, New York is not a sensible place to make theatre. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why so much that is good, and a lot of good stuff does come out of New York, um, happens because those who make theatre have such, have such insuperable odds. Um, uh, they've got so much stacked against them. So the good stuff, example, the brilliant show Here Lies Love, the, uh, the um, David Byrne, uh, musical about Mulder Marcos that we did in the Dorfman a few months ago. So phenomenally energetic and original, but that's very, very hard. You have to be re really fight to get something like that together in New York. And I didn't have that kind of energy or know-how, and this is a better place to make theater, and movies are not for me. So I got that out of my system. And I always knew that, that if the opportunity 
arose at the right time, um, I'd want to do this. And in all honesty, I had got bored with myself as a director. I thought, there's very few of us who are so remarkable that it's worth going uh, decade after decade just churning out the shows. You need, I felt that, that I needed um, to do something else, to, 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 um, to be less fixated on, on the gig in hand, um, because which is what it can sometimes feel like. That's why so many theatre directors uh, do branch off into movies or television or opera or they write. Um, it's, uh, so identifying myself with this institution, with its magnificent history, uh, working not on two shows a year but on 20 shows a year, working with writers who I would never work with otherwise, actors who I would never work with, directors I would never work with. It just felt like something I needed to make myself available for. So it, it, uh, it, when Trevor decided to move on, it was exactly the right time. Mm -hmm. And where did um, the incredible partnership with Nick Starr begin? Uh, yeah, you are absolutely right to, uh, to highlight that. Uh, I wouldn't have applied for the job if I hadn't already uh, worked out with Nick um, a plan of campaign. I'd met Nick here at the National Theatre. He was in the press office when I did my first show, Ghetto. Richard quickly realised uh, how much he had to offer and he became head of planning in short order. And many of the systems that we still use here were invented by Nick in the 90s. Uh, and I realised that uh, I simply didn't have the skill set to do the job in its totality. Um, I have no particular managerial expertise. Um, I've got an instinct for making sure that what we do um, costs what it needs to cost and a nose for where the income might be, but no expertise. Um, and Nick is the strategic brain, and that started before I applied. Um, and I made it very clear to Chris Hogg, the chairman who appointed me, that um, I came as a job lot. Uh, d the proper processes were observed um, when the executive director job came up. Um, and I apologise to those who um, applied at the same time as Nick Starr. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the many things you arrived with was, 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 of course, the Travel X ticket scheme, which yeah. is still in existence here and has spread across the cultural sector um, in an extraordinary way. Where did that incredible, very simple but incredible idea come from? Well, uh, the, there was a kind of pessimism in the early 2000s about how feasible it was to fill this place every night, and it wasn't full. And it just felt one of those intuitively obvious things, that it was better to be full at a considerably reduced price uh, than two-thirds full at full price. Also, perfectly plain that if you announce um, overpriced tickets and you then, when they don't sell, discount them, uh, the audience smells a rat. Uh, and this place, in any event, um, felt like a place that uh, needed to be uh, available to everybody who wanted to give it a try. So that was the intuition. Um, fill the place uh, at lower prices uh, because the Olivier in particular was really struggling. Uh, and struggling even with core rep, um, let alone with big new plays, which was another of the things that I talked about right from the beginning. We've got to get the younger generation of playwrights excited about working on a big scale again because everything's been reduced to a black box. Uh, and I've always been uh, more interested as a director, as an impresario, in getting a thousand people together than a hundred people together. That doesn't mean that I haven't had some of the most intense and extraordinary experiences of my life uh, in theatres that seat a hundred or two hundred people. What it means is, uh, I believe very strongly that there needs to be a national theatre that regularly puts itself at the centre of cultural discourse and um, maybe even uh, discourse wider than the cultural discourse. And you can't do that if you're playing to, um, if you're playing to uh, however, however diverse uh, your, 100, your 100 people might be uh, in many ways, there's still only 100 people. It's by definition um, uh, 
a, not uh, a public experience. Uh, so filling this place, filling the Littleton, felt like what we were here for. Uh, and making sure that people who hadn't come gave it a try felt really important. So um, the, um, the Travelex uh, scheme uh, was something we actually committed to and announced before we had a sponsor. Um, I mean, the story has been told often before. We thought we had another sponsor who pulled out. Uh, and Travelex, uh, Lloyd Dorfman, came in pretty much at the last moment, uh, by which time we'd already said we were, we'd already announced the shows and we would already announced the price they were going to be sold at um, and uh, it's so that it, that was a that was a, t t uh, a real communal achievement uh, the uh, uh, amongst all my colleagues here um, the um, production department with whom I worked to find ways of producing uh, more efficiently more cheaply uh, designers and directors who signed on for the concept uh, and our development department who found the sponsor um, it, and Nick who, who worked worked out how um, worked out how the how, how the money would happen how how, how we would afford it uh, but it's only it's a means to an end um, and even I have to say uh, from the point of view of my own personal satisfaction, the audience is a means to an end. I, it's uh, because uh, it's, it's getting excited by the work that makes the job worth doing. Um, and one of the things that, that uh, I, I, I say because it, it really is the kind of thing that if you're a member of the audience, um, uh, you just got to take it on trust from me that it's, it's one of those mysteries which I'm afraid you can never be part of. Uh, the first run through 20 times a year, oh yes, yeah, sometimes it's terrible, sometimes it's really depressing. But <laughs> over the last 12 years, going in time after time to a rehearsal room, um, and 18 of those 20 I didn't direct. My first run through because I'm the director is never good enough. It's always enraging, infuriating. I feel completely incompetent. I feel it's never gonna come together. But some of the stuff we've done seeing it for the first time in a rehearsal room, that's, that's when I walk out on air. It's a different kind of exhilaration you feel when it connects with an audience. But the reason why it's so great that we have now so many regular patrons and so many occasional patrons who pack the place out uh, for any number of different kinds of shows. The reason why that's great is it enables us to do the different kinds of shows. There are, there's no writer, no theater maker, no kind of show, no kind of experience, which we can't now take a punt on and find an audience for. And the reason that's exciting is because it's exciting to do the work. In that first season, uh, you had uh, Henry V, Adrian yeah. Rest is Henry V. It was, quite, it was a very strong statement of intent, I felt at the time, yeah. such a politically galvanized production. Yeah. Uh, was that a deliberate statement, setting out your store for, for your tenure? Yeah. Well, d it's, d as with so many of the what feel in retrospect like big, bold decisions, it was partly, yes, it was. I, th I, I, I love doing Shakespeare. Uh, I think it's an equally bold statement, I have to say, to kick off with every man, a kind of uh, underseen great mm -hmm. English play, uh, which is plainly should be the kind of thing that the National Theatre has as its core. But Henry V, bizarrely, had never been done by the National Theatre, despite the fact that it was one of Olivier's most famous parts. He did it long before he became director of the National Theatre. Um, and it was before we'd gone to war in Iraq that it was programmed and before we'd gone to war, that I'd asked Adrian Lester to play Henry V. Uh, and when we did go to war, uh, the play, as Shakespeare does, just changed meaning. So it would have been bizarre not to do it the way we'd done it. It would have been, in a way, more of a statement not to have done it as a play about uh, a British army uh, embarking on a foreign adventure uh, with... Um, questionable grounds in, inter in international law. Um, questionable, I use the word advisedly. I mean, the play is not, the play doesn't say, 
uh, the, the play probably thinks it's saying um, uh, hero king invades France for very good reasons. But Shakespeare is always too multi-layered, ambiguous, contradictory a playwright ever to go with a single statement. Just felt like um, it, it felt like a pragmatic decision. Uh, also a statement of intent. I wanted to do Shakespeare and I wanted to do it in a fresh and contemporary way. And then, and then it turned out that you know, we were doing the right play at the right time. Another statement, 2004, um, His Dark Materials in yeah. here. Um, uh, an extraordinary commitment to our work for young people and a very different view, very different from Wind yes. of the Willow, say. Well, one of the things that happens if you are a... If, I mean, th maybe this doesn't happen to all directors or all people who run theatres, but it certainly happens with me, is that as soon as something's done, all I can think about is how differently I want to do things next time. So a lot of the decisions I take about the work I direct and the work we program is in reaction to something that's happening at the moment. Uh, we've got to, that's either, well, that's terrible, we need to get it better next time, or that's good, but we need to now strike out in a new direction. I didn't, I, I loved the experience of doing Wind in the Willows, and the thing I liked about Wind in the Willows was the extraordinary use it made of the stage machinery here. I thought it will be good to get that out and dust it down and use it again. Uh, uh, um, it, it hadn't been used for a while, but mainly I thought, I want to recommit to the big family show. Uh, and I was nudged in the direction of his Dark Materials, which I, uh, which I hadn't uh, read by the then head of the literary department, Jack Bradley. They felt completely impossible, in the same way as War Horse felt impossible. Uh, that's always a provocation. Uh, and uh, to do a big two-part epic uh, based on these in extraordinary stories uh, and to use the stage fully, that was something I wanted to do. Now, as soon as it opened, and particularly in the years since, um, but it was, it was a great, great event. It, it, to my surprise, it's so, the first year before it even opened, it sold out before it opened. I hadn't rumbled how extraordinarily popular those books were. And I don't joke when I say that one of the things that really jazzed me about it was being out in the foyer and hearing teenagers furiously ear bashing their parents, telling them it wasn't good enough because, because it missed out this and it, and it got that wrong. The parents hadn't read the books the teenagers had and the teenagers, that, well, everyone's a critic, but teenagers were, they were, that, some of them liked it. I've, I've actually, I think in honesty, they liked it, but it really entertained them to find out what decisions we'd made and dis to disagree with some of them. The di decision I made, which in retrospect, I think it was great at the time, but it was scenically massive. If I did it now, um, I've seen War Horse, I've seen Coram Boy. The thing that I come out of 12 years at this place with is this fantastic education I've received from all the other directors that I've worked with. And what, the, the, I say Coram Boy and War Horse, they were the shows that followed, the, the, all, th all three shows, Dark Materials, Coram Boy and War Horse, ran two consecutive seasons here and then obviously War Horse still running. Um, they, were s they were staged with such uh, imagination, economy, wit, and much less elaborately than his dark materials. So as the impresario, um, I'm thrilled. I could, I'm so I'm thrilled at being able to be part of the process just as a kind of critical friend. But as a director, I'm thinking, oh, I'll do better next time. And I hope that that's, um, that's, one, of the, that's one of the things that I carry out with me. I've, uh, I'm, I'm, not being, I'm not doing that you know, gushy showbiz thing. When I say that, God, I've, that from, from so many directors, actors, writers, I've learned so much. So I, 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 I got less bored with my own work. That was, a, that was a good, being so busy, working with so many other people, I found my, I, I, I started to re-endorse my own work, which was <laughs> it. Um, next up was the History Boys. Yeah. How did you cast that, those young men so well, brilliantly? Well, half of them were in his Dark Materials. They just cross crossed over from his Dark Materials to, to the History Boys. Uh, Dominic Cooper, Sam Barnett, Russell Tovey were, in, were, were, were big parts of his dark mm. materials. Uh, um, 
the rest, were, uh, Toby Whale was the casting director at the time. Um, he, the way the casting director works is they, uh, now Wendy Spawn they, uh, and the whole department, they, they, are, they know the widespread of talented people available and they present them like a banquet uh, to, uh, to the director and the writer. Very often, you know, um, I have a very, now I've worked with, seen so many actors here over the years, um, I get there quite quickly. But history boys, they just all came in, you know. Um, in he came, James Corden. He had the part within seven seconds. I mean, he was, <laughs> he was auditioning us within seven <laughs> seconds. <laughs> um, around this time, uh, your relationship with DV8 began. Um, and that was a really key well, I, I, yes, key I've part loved of the I've loved working with I've loved working with companies who make theatre in a completely different way to me. A huge, always been a huge admirer of DV8, Lloyd Newson, but it was great also to work with Knee High, with Improbable, with companies who had maybe found their, a natural home at somewhere like Battersea Arts Centre. Uh, I was introduced to Tom Morris by Nick Starr. I mean, that's the secret of our relationship, is that, we d is that it's not that I do that and he does this, it's that we both, we b we both share everything. And Nick's creative now um, is something I rely on every bit as much as his, um, as, as, as his uh, producer's now, as his uh, managerial now. He introduced me to Tom. Tom became an associate director. And a hell of a lot of stuff which I had had a relatively distant relationship with, just going to see and thinking, that's good, but it's not what I do. Um, I got to know better through Tom. Tom took me, um, Tom took me to all sorts of uh, great things. I mean, uh, um, uh, Felix Barrett's, my mind's blanking. What's Felix's? Punch drunk. Punch drunk. But Tom took me to uh, a very early Punch Drunk show in a, in a warehouse in Kennington. It's just not the kind of theatre I make or know how to make. Um, and DV8 actually was, uh, was, was something that was... Lloyd, I just got in touch directly because I've always followed um, uh, contemporary dance. Uh, but brilliant, brilliant for all of us that, that those shows have happened here, that those influences have arrived at the National Theatre. They bring their own audience with them. And, you know, there's a, um, there's a hardcore audience at the National who would never see a DV8 show if it wasn't here. Um, and maybe, you know, they go out thinking, not for me, but they've had a taste. Skipping over War Horse, Much Ado, England People, NT Live. 2009. Where, where did that idea, well, Federal being the first? Yeah, well, the, the Metropolitan Opera was already doing it. And, um, and so it, I, I can't claim um, that this was something we invented. Uh, but there was a lot of scepticism, some of which I shared. I, was, I, I knew that we had to do this. But I had a fear always that if we did it, it would look like bad movie making or overlit TV projected large. And I genuinely thought, as did many of the actors to begin with, that the experience would be jarring, horrible. There's so much of a, of, of a, of a, um, a difference in category between opera and cinema that when you watch opera on a big screen, you don't bring any cinematic yardsticks um, to bear in the way you're watching it. I was afraid that you would go to the cinema, watch Phaedra, and they'd all look as if they were shouting and overacting, and they'd look as if they were overlit. And the thing which, partly because uh, the technology is so much better than it used to be, partly because we had six cameras, able to rehearse with the cameras, able with very expert camera directors uh, to work out very good shooting scripts. Uh, but also because of something I don't quite understand, it doesn't feel like going to the cinema. It feels like going to the theatre in a, in, in a movie house. Uh, and it's, uh, it was uh, um, something I um, just kept droning on about. And eventually it was Lisa Berger, the chief operating officer here, who said, this year, we're, I'm going to find, you've been talking about this often enough, we're going to find the money for it. Um, and we asked David Sable to, uh, to do a feasibility study, and that was so persuasive that we then asked him to, to launch the scheme. And uh, it was a game changer. And 
The interesting thing about the whole digital element is I think much more will happen, which we kind of can't conceive of yet. Um, it, it, broadcasting theater live to cinemas, that felt like a, a, a pretty obvious step. I think that probably a thing's going to happen over the next 10, 20 years, which we just don't, we don't have the language to talk about yet because it's not happened yet, but I think it's, it is going to be exciting. After that came uh, James Corden's return, One Man, Two Governors. Yeah. Um, again, another fruitful uh, writer relationship with Richard Bean. Yeah. Did you think that that had the global legs that it had? No, I've, to I've told this, this story before. I told it when, it when it happened. There was a very gloomy um, uh, summer um, uh, booking period about to be announced, and there was a gap in it, which I, I, I very often... Um, committed myself mentally to that slot there and waited to program it to see what the national needed. I've enjoyed doing that. I've enjoyed saying, okay, I'll do Major Barbara. Um, I'll see whether I can get on with Shaw. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, I, I know, I, very often it's, I know we need a comedy and uh, uh, they all go, ooh, I didn't want to do a comedy. And I go, uh, <laughs> And I go, well, it's all right, I, I will. I quite like doing it. Um, <laughs> I love the experience of the audience collapsing. I mean, you know, the, the single most exciting evening I've ever spent in any theatre anywhere was the first preview of the History Boys when, when you just, oh, my God, this, this is like rock and roll. Um, and we didn't know that. Uh, so there we were with a slot. It had to be comedy. It had to be me. Um, and The Servant of Two Masters was, I mean, I played the Corden part when I was at school. Uh, and I was also looking for something for James, who was going through that trough. I mean, it, 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 it's now he seems unstoppable, but, but at that time, everybody hated him. Um, and I knew, I knew how good he was. So, so that came as a kind of package, and it came together quite quickly. Um, most, mostly, I'm not necessarily generating the ideas, but I knew it was that play. I knew it was James. I knew the, uh, it was going to be finding the equivalence between you know the old italian tradition and the old english tradition um between commedia dell'arte and over the pier and i asked richard to do it and it came together very quickly um and you know all sorts of i said to tom morris so who should i get to do all the physical stuff and it was tom who's very often he said oh you well yeah, do you remember cal mccrystal of spy monkey who uh, whose work i'd seen you know if cal hadn't done all that physical stuff it wouldn't have been half as funny but it, was, um, it, it, it wasn't that much fun to rehearse. Uh, it, it, was, it wasn't that it was horrible. It's just rehearsing stuff whose only purpose is to make you laugh is not a particularly grateful thing to do. It's <laughs> you just have, because after the first, second, third time through, nobody's laughing anymore. And um, <laughs> so it feels kind of, the, the, the rehearsal room feels airless and you just have to keep drilling it and keep trusting that it will be funny one day soon when it's spontaneous again and when there's an audience in front of it. So, it, so the first preview of that was pretty exciting. Uh, Alec Reed Blythe and Adam Cork's London Road, another extraordinary risk of a production. Was that a rehearsal room moment where you went, oh my God? No, that, was, that came out of um, a studio weekend or a studio week uh, where, um, where the studio was inviting musicians and playwrights to a kind of um, a marriage bureau. Uh, and in one of these, they, they happened every now and then, every year or two, in one of these marriage bureaus, uh, Adam and Alecky, who is a verbatim playwright, uh, struck up a relationship. And I went to hear a sing-through of the first half of it at the studio. And again, it's just one of those things where when you describe it, you think, no way, that can't <laughs> possibly work, a verbatim piece. Um, and Alecky, at the time, was pretty hardcore. Her actors used to, in, in, in shows that I'd seen that she had created, her actors wore... Um, uh, headsets in order to reproduce exactly um, the speech patterns, the, the inflections of the witnesses that she had interviewed. Um, uh, and the idea that that kind of thing could be set to music felt so crazy that it was certainly worth a couple of hours of my time. 
I was blown away by it and just said yes. That's again one of the great, that's been one of the great joys, just being able to say yes. That's a joy that, um, that very few theatre directors, directors of theatres have. I mean, this place can, when it wants to, just say, we're going to do it, doesn't matter who comes to see it, or it doesn't even matter whether we get anybody to see it, this is plainly worth doing, and that's what that's what happened there. 2013, uh, the 50th anniversary fell on your shoulders, um, and I wonder, there was, there was an extraordinary moment for me when we were at the Old Vic with Lady Olivier performing St. Joan, with you filming her, it seemed like an incredible crossing it of was, the generations. It was, an, it was an extraordinary, that was, that was one of the most uh, moving, um, moving things I've ever witnessed. Um, we asked Joan Plowright uh, if she would do a speech from St. Joan. We asked her uh, not to do it live, but to do it on stage at the Old Vic. It felt like a really good way um, to, 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 one of the things that we should kick off the 50th anniversary with was something done from the stage of the Old Vic. That was her great part in 1963. Um, and uh, she's, she, she d has difficulty with her sight these days, uh, Joan. Uh, and she came to the front of the Olvik stage and she, she said, um, am I at the front? Am I facing the horseshoe? And we said, yes. She said, can I, can I, um, can I retake? I, mean, I, I don't really know this. I might need lots of takes. Is that okay? I said, absolutely, you know, that's absolutely fine. It's brilliant that you're here. And we did one take. And the, a camera crew who didn't really know what it was, they just turned up with the cameras. They were, they were as tearful as I was, as you were. It was, uh, it, was, uh, it was completely extraordinary. And I think it was one of the best performances on that night. It was amazing. She uh, emailed today. So sorry I'm unable to be there to celebrate your great achievements, Nick, at the National. I send my warmest wishes for an equally exciting future. Farewell, thank you, and bon voyage. That's oh, what that's she well, said. Oh, that's lovely. That's rather lovely. Yeah. Um, Moving on, Great Britain, what a coup that was, uh, holding a, performance, uh, a production completely secret in rehearsal. Yeah, I w I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that I would uh, I want to do that again. It was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was um, it w you know, when we, we, c we scheduled it, rescheduled it, rescheduled it again, and when we finally scheduled it, it felt inconceivable that that trial would drag on, and we had very clear legal advice that you mustn't announce you're doing it until there's a verdict. Uh, because you'll be in contempt of court. And that's okay, that's fine, that, that, there'll be a verdict. Uh, and, uh, and we went into rehearsal and there was no verdict. And it, it became increasingly clear that we would be ready with it and there would be no verdict. And I, I think the jury, I can't even remember now when the jury was sent out, whether, I think it hadn't even been sent out on the day, oh, I think maybe it was sent out on the day we should have been opening. Uh, <laughs> and then we were told, oh, it could take three or four weeks. Um, and the nightmare was always going to be a hung jury. And that was a, 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 how staunch the board was there is something that I will forever be grateful for. Nobody on the board said, no, this is ridiculous, you shouldn't be doing this. On the contrary, they said, this is plainly the kind of thing the National Theatre should be doing. Uh, out now, raucous, um, um, big, grotesque cartoon of a satire about uh, the press and uh, the police and, uh, and the political establishment. Uh, it, the, it, it was not designed to have any subtlety. It was designed to be a kind of big smack around the face. Um, we had already worked out, I mean, I can say now, uh, at one point we were advised, uh, if the principals are acquitted, you can't do this play. They will come after you for libel. But we thought about it and realized how there might be a version of the play where uh, the, the defense that was offered was built into the play as the truth. And the defense was that the editor of the newspaper in question um, had no idea what was going on. Um, and implicitly, um, actually, more or less explicitly, the defense was saying uh, my client was either not competent enough or too stupid to know that this was happening. So we had a version of the play where there was a very stupid editor. And it, um, <laughs> I am prepared now to reveal there was also a version, um, it has been pulped, um, where, um, where the Billy Piper character um, became editor. Um, which she didn't in the version we, uh, we performed. We had no opinion. We were prepared to leave it to the jury. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Talking of the political establishment, uh, there's an election around the corner. What do you think uh, is uh, what's ahead for the arts? What challenges? Do you know one of the things that is absolutely wonderful about today is don't I have don't to have to have an opinion anymore. <laughs> I am so bored of all my opinions. <laughs> So, no, pass, Angus. I'm okay, it's fine. <laughs> it's, it's actually after six o'clock, so you're no longer an employer here. Yeah, so, so that's okay. So you're now fine. I can be you're released. <laughs> yeah. so With that in mind, you can be absolutely frank. We've got to wrap up to let Treasure Island on shortly. A few, few uh, quick things off the top of your head. Um, what of your own productions is your favourite that we will cherish? Uh, it would be too obvious to say the History Boys, so I'm going to say Much Ado About Nothing. And a production by someone else? Um, the White Guard. Uh, is there a single performance by an actor that you will carry in your heart? I'm Marie Duff in St. Joan. A great moment in the rehearsal room that we never saw that you did. Um, actually, what I remember is it, it was not an easy moment. Uh, poor old Michael Gambon in the first, or actually the first week of rehearsal of The Habit of Art, he was, he was not well and didn't turn up. And the second week he turned up. And after about three days, so we're now one and a half weeks into a six-week rehearsal period, uh, he collapsed. And it was very scary. He, he genuinely collapsed. Uh, and he was stretched out with oxygen. Um, and it, someone said to him as he was, um, as he was being put into the uh, ambulance, uh, do you want us to give a message uh, to everybody in the rehearsal room? And he said... Um, uh, there's no need for me to send them a message. They're already talking to fucking Simon Russell Beale. <laughs> here, here, here is... Here is the terrible, brutal, unsentimental truth about the theatre. We were in the canteen recasting it at the time. <laughs> and Simon wasn't available. And so... <laughs> Uh, so and, uh, so d uh, the next day, um, I called Richard Griffiths, who had every right to say, hang on a minute, um, I did you proud in the History Boys, and you didn't ask me first time round, why are you asking me now? But uh, Richard was not like that, and I called him out of the blue, and his wife said, oh, I'll just go and get him, how nice to hear from you. There was a long, long pause. And he came on the line and he said, you will be interested to hear that I have come to you from my exercise bike. <laughs> <laughs> I, s I said, yeah, that's very interesting. Explain to him the situation. And he said, I'll start on Monday. He was, he was, he was great. <laughs> on Monday morning, what will you miss most about not coming to the National? I will miss um, and will always miss the fact that... Uh, the company here, just the, the just hanging around uh, the corridors, the canteen, the offices. Uh, there's so many people here, and they are such fun to be with. Um, and I will never have that gregarious a working life on a daily basis again. Whatever happens, it's not going to be quite like that. Uh, the point about the National Theatre, I think this has probably been the point for more or less every one of its 51 years is that people really, really love working here. It's the most fantastic working environment, and I will miss that. What will you miss the least? Um, oh, uh, I, 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 I'm just going to repeat. I will be so happy not to have to have opinions anymore. So. <laughs> um, will you write a book? I will try to write a book, but I haven't, I haven't kept a diary. I won't write a memoir. I won't be writing in on April the 1st, 2003. I walked through the stage door and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so I've got to find a way of writing what feels like an interesting book about what it feels like to work in the theater. Um, I'd like to write not too long a book that might be interesting to people who aren't that interested in the theater, but that's an absurd ambition. Um, <laughs> And uh, it, 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 it won't happen immediately, but, um, but it, yeah, it's something I've thought about. And now you're no longer an employee. Is there a regret? Is there a stinker that you're a... Oh, my God. D uh, of course, they've been terrible stinkers. <laughs> um, and they've also been um, uh, shows which have been enormous hits, which I've hated and everybody else in the building has hated. And the, one of the nice things is that... Um, when I've been to see those run-throughs, I have been able to report, um, no, 
it, it's not very good, but it's okay, everybody's going to love it. And, um, <laughs> and I, I don't know whether it's that I've imposed my taste on all my colleagues, <laughs> but by and large, um, it hasn't happened very often, maybe three or four times, and I, no way am I going to reveal what the shows are. <laughs> um, but by and large, there's the, the eye rolling here is pretty communal. <laughs> we do play a game sometimes, the five worst shows of the last 12 years. Not going there, not going there. <laughs> it's been fun playing it. <laughs> um, Nick, our time is done. Your time is done. It's extraordinary. Um, on behalf of the staff, thank you so much for your leadership, for the opportunities you've given us and the trust you've given us. Well, um, it's been great. I want to say, because uh, I know a lot of my colleagues are out there, but I want to say to them that uh, it's been a blast. But I also want to say, I mean, you know, those of you who turn up to the platforms. Um, I, know, I know you are um, our most committed, our most loyal, our most perspicacious. Um, and it's been a real joy um, doing stuff for you these last 12 years. And um, uh, it's something I'm going to say again at the, par the surprise party. <laughs> 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 oh my god! But uh, it's not given to many people to know that they've spent uh, 12 of the most active years of their life uh, doing something that was really worth doing. And it's been given to me, and I will always be grateful for it. Ladies and gentlemen, the hashtag is thank you, Nick, on Twitter. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Nick Heitner. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.